Now, friends, this morning I want to, I want to um, my, the title of mes- my message is Why Praise? Why Praise? The season that we're in, this year has seen us entering into a wonderful realm, congregation, this wonderful realm congregationally more and more. So blessed Wednesday nights to come and to worship the Lord full throttle often. Yep. It's wonderful when we go full throttle. And... Uh, and I'm not going to probably introduce too much new material this, this morning. Um, we, all know, and we all know that the, the name Judah means praise. And we're going to have a little, a bit of a walk through the Bible uh, and look at the exploits of Judah in the Old Testament. So we all know that Judah means praise. That's not new. Colin, give us something new. I probably won't. Uh, When this son of Israel, or Jacob, was born, his birth was ushered in by praise on behalf of his mother Leah. She was the wife, the first wife of Jacob, the mother of Judah. And we're going to read in the the Bible account of his birth, then consider the very powerful purpose of praise. So if you would turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 29... We're going to be reading from verses 31 to 35. The birth of praise. The birth of Judah. And I'd love to commend Ian this morning for stepping up to the microphone and encouraging us to praise God with our unknown tongue. Just those of us that have been around a while, and I've been around a while, we've had congregational worship sometimes that we've broken into singing in the spirit, as we call it, singing in tongues that has lasted for ages. But somehow or other, the modern church seems to have gotten away from that raw worship. And you know, friends, the times when we've gone into those times of free worship have been the times when God has become, come so close to us. He's opened our hearts, our spirits and our minds by revelation. And it's a wonderful, wonderful exercise. Paul the Apostle says in 1 Corinthians 14, he said, I will sing with my understanding, I will sing with my spirit. I will pray with my understanding, I will pray with my spirit. And that's a wonderful exercise. And thank you very much, for Ian, for doing that. I was blessed and touched, and I think most of us were. Genesis 29, verses 31 to 35. I'm just watching my watch there. Uh, verse 31 says, When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, and I've got that in red in my notes, When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, he opened her womb, but Rachel, the other wife, was barren. Leah became pregnant and she gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, for she said, It is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. And the name Reuben means the Lord sees her misery. (laughs) Sorry, Reuben. Where's Reuben? You didn't... Your mum didn't see, that's just a nice name, your mum didn't see misery, but Leah did, (laughs) because she was feeling quite unloved by her husband. Surely my husband, she said, will love me now. Verse 33, she conceived again, and she gave birth to a son. She said, because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon, which means one who hears. Again she conceived, verse 34, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, Now at last my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Now that was a place of great value in the culture of the day to bear sons. She said, I have borne him three sons, so she named him named Levi, named him Levi, which means attached. She conceived again, number four. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, This time I will praise Jehovah. This time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah. And Judah sounds like in the Hebrew, and may be derived from the Hebrew for the word praise. And so praise was born in the Scriptures. From this passage of Scripture, we may pick up Leah's feelings of being devalued, unloved, longing from a place of brokenness to aspire to a place of dignity and significance. Now, Paul, the last two times Paul preached from this pulpit, he mentioned David, David the great psalmist. And we all know that psalm means praise. Uh, The great psalmist was caught up, like a lot of human beings are, in the web of sin and deceit, and he covered it up for a long time until Nathan the prophet, his good friend, Nathan the prophet was bold enough to come to David and expose him with a parable, remember? 
I thought, wow, what a novel way of introducing parables. But Nathan came with a parable and David was absolutely astounded that someone could be as horrible as that. And Nathan turns to him and he says, David, you're the man. You're that person. And of course, David immediately becomes broken before God. And Paul said that some of the most beautiful Psalms, Psalm 139, Psalm, 1, Psalm 51, came out of a heart that was broken before the Lord, and that was David's heart. And uh, we look at Leah, this dear woman. After giving birth to three sons, an extremely enviable status in the Hebrew culture of the time, and still having to battle the feelings that had plagued her, plagued her life, Leah makes a decision. Out of her brokenness, she comes to this point and she said, this time I will praise the Lord. Folks, there comes a time out of our brokenness we need to praise the Lord. And I believe it's the sweetest time in God's sight is when we out of our brokenness offer a sacrifice of praise, thanksgiving and blessing to the Lord. He is truly blessed. She said, this time I will. I just might not, maybe, she said, I will praise the Lord this time. And friends, this decision would give her a most valuable status in the kingdom of heaven. Forever setting, a place, setting in place a most powerful and valuable principle. From Judah's line, from that baby's line, would flow Israel's greatest kings in David and Solomon. You think about it. She didn't know it at the time. Out of her brokenness, she said, this time... This time, I will praise the Lord. She didn't realize that out of that lineage of that baby would flow Israel's greatest kings. Some of them that we could spend days, years preaching on how God blessed them and how they blessed the kingdoms was David and Solomon. Some of Israel's greatest and most durable prophets came out of the tribe of Judah, the tribe of praise. I think of one of the, most, one of the foremost men would be Daniel. With his young friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel 1.6. David endured, uh, sorry, Daniel endured and counted for God through the rise and the fall of several foreign empires. He didn't do anything. And yet he was part of the uh, group of Judea, of the tribe of Judah that was carried away captive. And yet that young man maintained a testimony before God, was tender before God, along with his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When they could have crumbled to the culture of the day, they stood strong in God. They would not compromise their place in God, their love of God, and their commitment to Jehovah God. And Daniel, we know, rose to be a wise man that counseled the kings of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, he would then go on to see that empire rise to its zenith and fall to the Medes. And under King Darius, he was a counselor and a confidant to King Darius. Why? Because he believed in his God. He loved his God. And then after the Mede, per, Mede, Median Empire fell to the Persians, he would become also a counselor to King Cyrus. So much were these men from the tribe of Judah. To these kings and kingdoms, Daniel's steadfast faith in Jehovah revealed the kingdom of heaven in an irrefutable superiority, superiority to all earthly kingdoms. And then, last but not least, Christ the Messiah would come through the earthly lineage of the tribe of praise, the tribe of Judah. Christ would be referred to frequently by the religious leaders as the son of David because they knew that his lineage had come through King David. Leah's decision speaks loudly to God's people today. God's people must be a praising people. That's not a legalistic must be. That's an advisory must be. We need to be, friends. God's people must be a praising people. The army of God must discover the power of praise and become skilled warriors in praise. Ern Baxter, if anybody remembers back that far, he was a great Bible teacher. Uh, about the same time as Derek Prince and many, many other men that inspired us, inspired the body of Christ worldwide. Ern Baxter said, Rise and soar into the sunlight rays, using both your wings of prayer and praise. Mount like eagles higher in the sky, and you'll find things look so different when you fly. I recently tuned into um, Bethel Music and Stephanie. 
Gretzinger, I pressed on the free worship uh, thing that's on YouTube there, and she began to prophesy before she sang. We're going to conclude this morning by singing that song, He is good, he's good. We're going to go out in warfare this morning, proclaiming his goodness over our week and over our lives. But uh, Stephanie just began to prophesy, and she talked about chickens and eagles. <laughs> and uh, when I was, I preached one time a notable sermon apparently in Coastlands years ago, and I imitated, being a farm boy, I imitated what I saw around me in the farm about the chickens. Chickens are only interested in that square meter of around them. They cluck, they scratch, they fight each other for the food on the ground. They've got wings, but they just can't fly like the eagle. And folks, we have eagle's wings. We have two wings, one of prayer one of praise and one of prayer. And there are many times we need to learn to soar on the thermals and rise up with the wings as eagles to meet God in his realm as he comes down to meet us in our realm. And our realms will be changed. Good friend of this house, Dudley Daniel, once said, prayer makes our need known, praise, praise releases the power of God on our behalf. Prayer makes our needs known. Not that God needs to know our needs anyway. He knows. But it makes our need known and praise releases the power of God on our behalf. Complaining contaminates. Have you ever noticed that? Complaining contaminates. Praise is contagious. The more we praise God, the more we will see our prayers answered in the positive. And I asked the, my title of my message this morning is Why Praise? And so I'm going to ask the question, Why Praise? The answer is, why not praise? But number one, praises hold a place closest to God's presence. And if you've got your Bibles, turn to Numbers chapter 2. Because in Numbers chapter 2, we're told that during the passage, the passage out of Egypt en route to the Promised Land, each of the 12 tribes had an assigned camping position uh, when they came to, into camp or at rest. And this position was in reference to the tent of meeting that housed the Ark of the Covenant, and what does the Ark of the Covenant represent? Presence of God. So they would camp around the presence of God. Wouldn't it be one? It's wonderful to camp around the presence of God. Your body and my body houses the presence of God. We're camped around the presence of God. But in Numbers chapter 2, guess which, which tribe camped closest to the presence of God? On the east where the sun rises. You, you got it. Judah did. Judah had a very privileged position. Praises, friends, have a privileged position in reference to the presence of God. Numbers chapter 2. When we come close to God, we know that he transforms us. We know that he al and allows us to take his presence and glory into the world. 2 Corinthians 3.18. In his presence, we are transformed. We're changed. Just like Moses was changed and he came off the Mount of the glory of God with a glowing face. I get a glowing face sometimes too, but it's because I get red and excited. I might have a bit of a, I feel like a bit of a glow there at the moment. But uh, it's not the glory. It's, but Moses came down the mountain with such, the, such of the glory of God because he'd been close to God that he, they, the Israel, is, Israelites who were naughty at the time, oh, we just threw some gold into the fire and lo, look what came out, a golden calf. Come on, we didn't come down in the last shower, guys. That golden calf had to have a mold made. We had to go around and gather the metal, put it in, put it in the furnace, and it just didn't pop out. That's a load of nonsense. But anyway, we're onto their tricks, and God's onto our tricks sometimes when we make excuses, eh? Numbers chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, it says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, The Israelites had to camp around the tent of meeting some distance from it. Each man under his standard, that is his banner or his flag. Each man under his, under his standard with the banners of his family. On the east towards the sunrise, what a wonderful position. The first to see the sun of glory rising of a morning would be Judah. Because on the east towards the sunrise, the divisions of the camp of Judah are to encamp under their standard or under their flag. The leader of the people of Judah is, is Nashon the son of Aminadab. His division numbers 74,600. There was a lot of them. You know, when they went into Egypt, 
Judah, Judah's family, he went into Egypt with three sons. He came out with 70, these 74,600, which were the men that were 25 years and over and were, were a part of the army. If we drop down to Numbers 126, or oh, that was according to Numbers 126, these 74,600 are the men 25 years or more eligible to serve in the army. They're the fighting men. Verse 9, if we go down to verse 9, all men assigned to the camp of Judah, according to their divisions, number 186,400. They will set out first. And I, as I stopped there in my preparation, I thought, I wonder what sort of flag the tribe of Judah, their banner or their flag, they were under. And so I had a little search. I had a guess that it was maybe a lion. <laughs> so I went to Unger's Bible Dictionary, who is a wonderful source of information for me, and he said, it's unknown, but according to rabbinical authority, Judah's banner on the standard was, given, was green with the symbol of a lion. Green's a wonderful color when you're a, when you're a farmer's son. You love to see green. And then on that green banner was a lion. No wonder Jesus was known as the lion of the tribe of Judah. It all ties in. I love the way that the Bible all ties in. Anyway, it's mere information unless you receive it by revelation. And hopefully the Holy Spirit's doing that. So, praises or the tribe of Judah was camped nearest the presence of God. Number two, praises, that is Judah, will be at the forefront of spiritual battles. Friends, there, there's a, life's a battle, no matter what you do, no matter where you go. There are bullets being fired at us at every second of the day. And we're in a warfare, whether we like it or not. But praises, those that worship God, those that are praises of God, will be at the forefront of spiritual battles. Have a look at Genesis 49. I want to read this to you. When we were worshipping God last Sunday, uh, the Lord sort of brought to my mind this scripture. In Genesis 49, it was Jacob the old man, Israel the old man, he was old. The book of Hebrews tells us that he was so old and feeble, he was leaning on his staff and depending on his staff of authority as he prophesied to the generations. And this is what he had to say over his son Judah. Verse 8, Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. What a fantastic place to be when you've got your enemy by the neck. And the Bible says the praisers will have their enemy by the neck. It's not like the book of Proverbs that said, a fool grabs a hold of a snarling dog by the ears. And I think that was a picture that, I thought, wow, if you buy, in, if you buy into somebody else's arguments and somebody else's business, it's like grabbing a hold of a, ra ravid, a rabid dog by the ears. What do you do with him? You see this face snarling at you. He's drooling with the spittle that he'd like to grab a hold of your throat. You've got him by the ears. But the Bible says, no, that's not like that. The, Ju the people of Judah, the praises, will grab their enemies by the throats and will be able to... S no, it won't go any further. <laughs> Makes me feel like the Terminator... I used to gain a lot of inspiration from him. <laughs> I still sometimes, I'm somewhere and I, uh, I'm at a door, knock, knock. And it reminds me, he used to go, knock, knock, and walk straight through the door without opening it. <laughs> no, friends, praises will be like that invincibility. There's a bit of invincibility there. Even when we were at the, our feeblest place, grab your enemies by the throat and, and Lord, I thank you, you're good. We are, we are the head, not the tail. And for, friends, you might not feel like grabbing them by the throat, but it's a good place to grab them because it says here, Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. You're a lion's, you're a lion's cub, O oh Judah. You return from the prey, my son, like a, like a lion. He crouches and lies down like a lioness. Who dares to rouse him? Who dares to take the prey from the lioness? be crazy the scepter will not depart from judah nor the ruler's staff from between his feet that literally means from his lineage will there will rise a ruler and we know that that's the son of son of god jesus the lord of lords and the king of kings 
until he comes to whom it belongs and the obedience of the nations are his. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. He will, he will wash his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. I love the thought that the, that the lion of the tribe of Judah will come and he will tether his donkey to a vine. The vine, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. The church, his donkey's tethered. No one mess with the one who rides that donkey in glory. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah and he inhabits our praises. So praises will be at the forefront of spiritual battles. And in Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 to 2, it says, After the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, Who will be the first to go and fight for us against the Canaanites? Good question. The Lord answers, Judah is to go. I have given the land into his hands. Judah is to go. And you know, we think about some of the famous people that descended from, the, from Judah. King Jehoshaphat is one of the favorite kings, isn't he? The king of Judah. His battle and victory is seen in 2 Chronicles. 20. The counselors came to Jehoshaphat and said, There's a massive army out there, man. Have a look at them. And he didn't take fright. He took his need to the Lord. And he developed a strategy from the Lord. And it says in verse 21, after consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness. So they went out at the head of the army saying, Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures. And they began to sing and praise the Lord. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab, Mount Seir, who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The fear of the Lord came upon all the kingdoms of the countries when they heard how the Lord had fought against the enemies of Judah. And the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. Don't run around and beat your plowshares into swords, Jehoshaphat. Just get the singers, the worshippers, to worship in front of the army. And the, and the purposes of God were released through praise, through worship. To the point that the army that was following behind the singers... All they had to do, their job, was to go out and pick up the loot from the dead bodies because the Lord had set ambushes and they ended up killing each other. Friends, the times when we're in need, the times when we just seem assailed by so many issues and so many things that trying to figure them out keeps you awake at night, just bothers you, you get ulcers worrying about them when Simply, we could say, I'm sending out praise, I'm sending out worship to the Lord, and the battle is the Lord's, it's not mine. Lord, you battle for me. And it's not long before, in the, in the wee small hours of the morning, instead of worrying in your dreams, God gives you a solution. And the solution, with the solution comes this sense of assurance and peace that's all, all is good. God's with me. I wonder if Donald Trump's been doing that this last week or so. <laughs> He's been in so much strife. And what's his famous line? It's all going to work out fine. <laughs> maybe, maybe he's turned to the Lord, I don't know, with all the issues he's got on his plate. Man needs a bit of prayer. Number three, praise inherits blessings, praise gives blessings. Friends, in order to bless people, we must be a blessed people. How do we get blessed? By praising the Lord. As we worship God, as we praise Him in the beauty of His holiness, He blesses us. And so as He blesses us, we can move out and bless others. We look at Caleb. Caleb is a famous son of Judah. He's born into the tribe of Judah. In Joshua chapter 14, verses 10 to 12, he says to Joshua, he said, So here I am today, 85 years old. He said, I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. That is to spy the land. I'm just as vigorous to get out to battle now as I was then. So he says to Joshua, give me that hill country. Give me this hill country that the, Lord's promised, or that the Lord promised me on that day. What would you do if you were a leader like Joshua and you had a, an old fellow that was coming up and saying, I'm just as vigorous to, 
I'm just as vigorous today as I was back. <laughs> you know what Joshua said? The Lord bless you. And he did. He went out and he took the hill country. He had to slay a few giants. Maybe he kneecapped them with his sword. I don't know how he did it. But he, he rid the country of giants and he took the land of Hebron. Now, we all know, we that are Bible scholars know that Hebron was where David's headquarters were. Later on, the Judah would appoint David king in Hebron. And seven and a half years went by before Israel says, Duh, maybe we should have David as the king over all, all of Israel, not just Judah. And so for seven and a half years later, they came down and they made David king and submitted to David at Hebron. And David ruled over a united kingdom. Not the UK that we know today, but a united kingdom of Israel. <laughs> we wish. <laughs> so, Deuteronomy 27, verses 11 to 13. In verse 12 it says, Moses commanded the people, When you cross the Jordan, these tribes shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people. Simeon, Levi, Judah, Ishika, Joseph and Benjamin. They were the tribes that were to stand and bless the rest of the tribes. In Numbers 6, 22 to 27, we see a blessing of prayer. This is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So they, put, so they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them, says the Lord. So Judah was one of those blessing tribes. They were to bless the rest of Israel, and they did. Praises are productive. If you want to be productive in your life, friends, be a praiser. Rise up in the strength of Judah and be a praiser. When Judah, when Judah went with his brothers down into Egypt at Joseph's invitation, he had just three sons. Uh, Genesis 46, I think it is, it speaks of how many, of the tri how many children of the tribes of Israel went down into Egypt. Remember there was famine on the land and uh, Joseph was identified to his brothers and because there was no food and there was famine in Canaan, Judah had lost two of his sons and he took three sons at that stage down into Egypt. When they came out of Egypt, the census told us, told us that there was 74,600. So greatly did Judah's family increase that at the first census after coming out of Egypt, it grew from three souls to 74,600, being first in population of all the tribes. At the second census, Judah had grown to 76,500, still retaining its rank in size as number one. Praises of God will be productive. They will be very, very fruitful. There are times when you do not feel fruitful. There are times when you have gone through seasons of bitterness and hardship. And the last thing you want to do is to praise the Lord. But we can sing, you are good, good, always good. And many of you know how I derive my income. Uh, I'm a relief teacher and term two is usually one of those terms where you have no time to, to take a breath almost. And I think I got down to the first week one and I'd had a half a day's work. I thought, this is not good enough, Lord. <laughs> I started to, you know, you just naturally in your humanity you start to worry and you see the bills that are coming and uh, my son Mark was on my side. He's been proclaiming and been in prayer on my behalf as well. And one morning I'd been singing, you are good, you are good. I'd get up at six o'clock. First thing is make the coffee. The coffee's good. <laughs> Go out to my office. Unlock the door because I want the cordless phone. I'll carry that around for the next hour or two waiting for a call. Don't want to, don't want to miss the call. I just get to the office. I've unlocked the office door and I turn the knob on the door and in my spirit after singing, you are good, you are good, the drought is going to break. And within about 10 minutes, there was a phone call. I kind of feel like it's been a wearying week. <laughs> I've had high school kids, I had year ones on Tuesday, year fives on Wednesday, year threes on Thursday, and high school kids from 10, 11, and 12 on Friday. <laughs> but
but it was a good weariness. It's a good tiredness. God, you're good. It's... You know, Hosea chapter 10, 11, chapter 10, 11 to 12, I like the 10, 11, 12. It says, Judah must plow and Jacob must break up the ground. Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap the fruit of unfailing love and break up your unplowed ground. For it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers righteousness on you. We all know from a farming point of view, there are There are areas of land that we leave fallow. It's important to leave ground fallow. Fallow means that you do not plough it, you don't produce a harvest for a period of time. It it just lies there unproductive. But scientifically, there's there's nutrient building up in that soil so that when you give the soil a Sabbath rest like that and you plough it, it becomes productive again and probably more productive than it would have been if you had just cropped it and cropped it and cropped it. And many of us, friends, have unproductive areas in our lives. You just look at your life sometimes and you get a bit reflective and say, oh, that area is a bit unproductive. That area looks like it's growing thistles and thorns and so forth. Friends, if you have unproductive areas like I've got unproductive areas in my life, there's one way to to make it productive, and that is through praise. Praise him. Worship him. Become a praiser. Judah must plough. The hard soil that must be loosened to create a crop must be ploughed. What will plough the ground? What will break the hard crust? Praise and worship. Glory to God. Give him thanks. Give him praise despite the un- what seems to be unfruitful. And we will find that that soil will become productive in our lives. Number five, praise ushers in unity. And I've made reference to this before. The tribe of Judah united the 12 tribes of Israel under the rule of King David after Saul's disastrous reign and death. Judah saw God's timing and purpose for David much clearer and much sooner than the rest of Israel. Does that speak to me and tell me, it does to me, that those who worship and praise God, they see God and they see his purposes ahead of most other people. And so... Judah had moved to make David their king at Hebron seven and a half years before Israel moved to make him king over all the tribes of Israel. Pray, people that praise, people that comp- complain, contaminate and divide. People who praise the Lord, it becomes contagious and your praise, you will unite people. There's a sense that God's praising army, the church like Judah, has made Jesus king And the time will come when the whole world will accept him and make him king also. But it's ushered ushered in by the army of praisers and worshippers. God awaits to fulfill Psalm 110 verses 1 to 2. In and through the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. You will rule in the midst of your enemies. And finally, you're doing well this morning. You're good listeners. I hope you're listening. Any phones out? Any Facebooking going on? <laughs> hey, Joel, saw that. <laughs> he did. No, he didn't have it. Finally, praises have authority. Judah has authority. It, it's time to take ground in our lives from our enemy. Praise ushers in God's authority first, making way for the Spirit of God to work supernaturally I don't have anything supernatural happening in my world let's offer praise and worship to God God chooses to live in the praises of his holy people Psalm 22 verses 3 to 4 in the Amplified Bible says but you are holy O you who dwell in the holy place where the praises of Israel are offered our fathers trusted in you they trusted they leaned on relied on you and were confident and you delivered them Matthew chapter 21, Palm Sunday, I know in the traditional church has passed, but Palm Sunday came, Jesus rode the colt of the donkey into Jerusalem. He was received by a multitude of children and others spreading their clothes on the ground, palm leaves, singing Hosanna, Hosanna to God in the highest. Do you know the praise and the worship of God's people really stirs up the religious? The religious, ho, 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 ho. They look like they've been sucking lemons for weeks. Some, 
some religious authority. Carpenter, stop those people from making that. Stop those people from worshipping. Stop those people from praising. What did Jesus do? He said, they've got to. If they didn't worship the, the one who was coming to his temple, the very stones along the way would cry out. Wow, I'd like to see the stones crying out and worship to God. The trees clapped their hands and worshipped before the Lord. But he said the very stones would cry out. The pavement would worship. So, <laughs> he didn't say that, but that's my, me and my humanity. So Jesus rides in to Jerusalem on a donkey to the praise and the adoration of the people. As a result of that, he is able to go into the temple where God should be living, where God lives. He was able to cleanse the temple of its illegal squatters and robbers, those that are crowding out the worship of the people. He healed the sick. He delivered those people that were possessed by demons. He delivered them from demons. But that occurred because of the worship of God's people. We want deliverance. We want productivity in our lives. We just want to make Jesus king and unify a city under God's banner. Then I think praise and worship is not an added, an optional extra. It's a necessity, isn't it? So, friends, that's it. I heard someone on the radio this morning talking about a lady who came as a refugee to Australia after the Second World War. And uh, he, she just made a home for herself. She was so pleased to be in a land like Australia. And this guy concluded, and he says, a grateful heart is a magnet for miracles. <laughs> and the guy, uh, the announcer on the end, other end of the uh, phone, he laughed about that. He said, oh, I love that. A grateful heart is a magnet for miracles, he says. I thought, I like that too. A grateful heart, a praising heart, is a magnet for miracles. Nate, could you come again, please? I've just had this song, The King of My Heart. With the King of My Heart. Could you guys come, please? Let's be grateful this morning. Let's set up a, set up a magnet for miracles. And this week, as you go out, as we go from this place, our week commences. Who knows what challenges are going to come our way, but whatever comes our way, the King is going to make way. And do you know the song that they sang in Jehoshaphat's day when they went out in face of the enemy is, you are good, you are good, Lord, you're good. And they sang it. Let's all stand to our feet this morning, friends. Our week is going to be capped by the glory and the goodness of God. We're not going to proclaim that, God, you're more than enough for anything that may come our way and meet us today. You are good. You are always good, Lord.